So you're playing against a melee cleave and you see all of your weak auras light up. The enemy team is popping, but you've trained all season for this situation. You know that all you need to do is use your defensive, so that's exactly what you do. You live the go and you're feeling great. That is, until you find yourself falling behind a minute later, only to lose the game instantly when your weak auras light up again. So what went wrong? We've seen a lot of low rated footage so far and we noticed that healers are panicking and popping a swifty defense macro every time they feel a light breeze in arena. Luckily though, we're here to show you exactly how to fix this. We will be comparing challenger and rival healers to the pros to see how low rated players misuse defensive CDs and how you should be reacting to damage in arena. First though, we have a quick question for all of you. What do you think will be the best healer in 9.1? We've already previewed some of the PTR patch notes and Mistweaver monks are looking pretty good, but do you think that they will be strong enough to hang out with the Holy Paladins in the high tiers? And if you want to stay up to date on the meta and all important changes when the patch hits, be sure to check out skillcap.com slash wow. There you will find our library of class courses and matchup analysis made by some of the best wow players of all time. Our team of rank 1 gladiators and professional players share their knowledge in videos that you won't find anywhere else. If you want to increase your skill and rating now and when the patch lands, be sure to check out skillcap.com slash wow today. Most of the time when we look at low rated players, we only talk about the mistakes being made by the person playing. This time though, almost everyone in the arena makes a huge blunder in the opener. Let's take a look at what just happened because it is a bit alarming. As you can see, just a few seconds into the game with absolutely no offensive CDs used, the enemy druid uses iron bark on his paladin while our monk trinketed a dispellable hammer of justice, and on top of that, he disarmed the ret who hasn't even used wings yet. So already a few seconds into the game, we have problems for both teams. No offensive CDs have been committed, but now the druid is missing iron bark and our monk is missing trinket. Let's see if our priest is able to react appropriately with their CDs. Keep in mind that you generally want to trade cooldowns for cooldowns. This means the only time you really need to use a defensive is when the enemy team uses an offensive. That way you can deny most of their damage and mitigate a lot of pressure when it matters. And here we see the paladin get avenging wrath. But wait just a second, why is this avenging wrath only 6 seconds long? That brings us to our first gladiator knowledge question. Why is the paladin's wings so short? Isn't it supposed to last 20 seconds? This should be pretty basic arena knowledge to many of our active viewers, so hopefully you know the answer. Well, it's because of the aura of reckoning PvP talent, which will periodically proc a 6 second wings after a ret paladin's team has been crit 50 times. Many lower rated players don't know about this miniature wings, and so they overcommit cooldowns just because they see their weak auras light up with avenging wrath. And that's exactly the mistake our 1300 priest makes. They saw their weak auras light up, so they instinctively used pain suppression into the fake wings. Now, later in the game, this will come to haunt them when they don't have pain suppression ready for the real wings, which lasts 20 seconds. As you can see, the paladin has now used their real avenging wrath. We know this because the duration is 20 seconds. Unfortunately, our priest doesn't have their main defensive cooldown to respond to the ret's biggest offensive CD. And even though they don't die to this mistake, they have to slam the heals on their keyboard harder than ever, as their monk's HP spikes harder than the rage bar of an LFG warrior. So what is the main takeaway here? Make sure to look at Aura of Reckoning stacks and check to see if you are dealing with the fake wings or the real wings. Ideally, you should use your CDs when you see the real Avenging Wrath. This is something that rank 1 players always look out for when fighting ret paladins. One way of anticipating when a paladin will use their real wings is to look at their other buffs. If we start at the paladin's buffs, they only have 6 stacks of aura of reckoning and on top of that, they have used their seraphim. Looking out for a seraphim is crucial, because it usually indicates that avenging wrath and divine toll are coming up. And right on schedule, you can see the enemy paladin pop their wings during seraphim. We know this is the real wings because it has a 20 second duration. Due to this, our rank 1 team uses some of their defensives in CC in order to reduce pressure from the ret during their primary offensive cooldown. Saving your cooldowns for when they actually matter is really important as a healer and is absolutely essential when playing against ret paladins. You always want to make sure that you have enough defensives available for when they use their seraphim avenging wrath combo. If you get juked by fake wings, you can be in some serious trouble. Not only do low rated players get tripped up by fake wings, but sometimes they also overcommit to using their defensive cooldowns. They will overreact in the opener only to have no gas left in the tank later on. Here we see a common opener from a windwalker DK with an AoE stun onto to our 1400 shaman and his team. Immediately after the stun ends, our shaman pops spirit limb. Now really quickly, we should realize that with a warrior on their team, 
A lot of this damage could have been avoided with an intervene or the other 5,000 defenses that warriors bring, but sometimes you can't rely on your partners as a healer, and it's up to you in order to save your team. With that in mind, why is it a mistake to use Spirit Link in this opener? Just like in Arena, you don't have that much time to think about this decision, so get your answer ready now. Well, first things first, let's rewind to when the stun happened. Going into this stun, our 1400 Shaman had a full Fleshcraft shield, probably absorbing around 15k damage. On top of that, he was playing with a warrior who has died by the sword, and a monk that has fists of fury to parry melee damage. Finally, the enemy team was stuck in an AoE stun. Even before the stun ends, our Shaman's first reaction was to Link. Now, keep in mind that Windwalker DK does AoE damage, and somewhere on the Shaman's bars, tucked away in the corner, is the perfect AoE damage reduction cooldown. I'm talking, of course, about Earthen Wall Totem. Instead of using Earthen Wall and Ascendance to heal the AoE damage, our 1400 Shaman instantly commits every other cooldown. What this means is that they won't have anything left the next time the Windwalker DK has a go. Most importantly, they won't have Spirit Link to use with their PvP trinket in case things get sketchy later on. Now, let's see how a rank 1 shaman handles a similar situation. Once again, we are up against a melee cleave that can deal super high AoE damage. This is the exact moment our rank 1 team gets AoE gripped. Now, pay close attention to our shaman's mouse. Instantly, our shaman reacts with an earthen wall totem, placing it directly under his entire team. Sometimes though, Earthen Wall isn't enough, and since his team is under so much pressure, it is okay to overlap with other cooldowns. You just want to make sure you don't overreact, leaving your team vulnerable for future goes. You should save your biggest cooldowns like Spirit Link Totem for situations where you would absolutely lose unless you press them. A perfect example of this is when dealing with Ret Paladins. Their upfront burst damage can be really scary, but it often isn't enough to force every major defensive you have. If you blow everything on the first wings burst, you might not have anything available for the next kill attempt. Always make sure you have enough cooldowns for the next go. Work on communicating cooldown rotation with your team so you always have something to deflect an enemy kill attempt. Sometimes lower rated players also make the wrong decisions on who they should be healing or who is truly under pressure. One of the classes that gets punished the most by this is Resto Druid, since in order to heal a target properly, they need to spend three or more globals applying hots. Sometimes players make the mistake of pre-hotting or pre-healing the wrong target, and this makes it more difficult to respond to enemy cooldowns. We are already a few seconds into this game, and we are about to experience some big problems. As you can see here, our 1800 Druid was counterspelled on their opening Cyclone. Sometimes tanking an interrupt is fine, but if we look at his teammates' health bars, nobody on his team has HOTS. Sometimes the best thing to do during lockouts is just to reposition, and to our Druid's credit, they do make some use out of their lockout by getting a Fleshcraft, though they probably should have done that in the starting room before the gates opened. Now, here is the exact moment where our Druid makes a huge mistake. He was behind on HOTS, so he decides to overgrowth his monk. But why is this such a huge problem right now? Take a look at the enemy comp for some clues. If you haven't figured it out, it is because he used overgrowth into a mage who probably has kleptomania. If the enemy mage wanted to, they could instantly remove all of the monk's HOTS at this moment. The only reason why this might be a good idea is to get klepto out of the way so our own fire mage can combust freely. But with the enemy warrior stuck in a bash and without any CDs being popped, there really isn't a reason to risk your overgrowth here when you don't need it. To make matters worse, our 1800 Druid commits Cenarian Ward to his monk even before the enemy team has really done any significant damage to them. And if we look at the position of the enemy warrior, they are tunneling our mage with Avatar, and they even used Warbreaker. One really good way of knowing who will need healing against caster melee teams is to follow the melee. Casters can hit targets from anywhere on the map, while melee need to be in someone's face to deal damage. If the melee is on your partner, they are likely the ones that will need the most healing. Now, we are in a situation where our mage is about to be under huge pressure, but we don't have overgrowth or scenario ward to help mitigate damage. And here, we can see the enemy mage has popped combustion, and with a single rejuve on our mage, things are not looking good. To make matters even worse, we don't even have a swift men to proc soul of the forest for a huge nature's swiftness. What this means is now our 1800 druid will really struggle to keep his mage up during these CDs. And with regrowth spam not being enough and with iron bark being used too late, our fire mage is forced to cauterize in the opening exchange of this game. Even the best players sometimes mismanage their hots and heals, but the biggest difference is that they know how to bounce back from it. Here, we have a rank 1 druid who has been recently counterspelled while their mage is dropping dangerously low. They use this lockout to reposition into a more defensive part of the map, and since they are playing with a fire mage, their goal is to preserve cauterize. And with their mage at risk of proccing, they instantly use their swift men nature's swiftness to get a huge heal on their partner. 
The enemy team wasn't popping CDs, so there was no real reason to use Iron Bark to mitigate damage. Instead, our focus was to make sure our mage doesn't drop low enough to proc Cauterize and remove an important safety net for later on. Look, we know things are hard as a healer. It's probably the hardest it's ever been, but that doesn't mean it needs to be impossible. Once you learn that you don't need to pop every cooldown in the opener, you will be able to manage cooldowns better in the mid game where things start to get really tricky. Of course, you are never alone in your team's defensive usage. On top of managing your own cooldowns, make sure you're actively communicating with your team so you always have a defensive available for an enemy kill attempt. It's obviously bad to never use any cooldowns, but sometimes it's even worse to use too many. By focusing on spreading out your cooldowns better both individually and as a team, we guarantee you will have more success in Arena. If you like this video, make sure to give us a like and subscribe with all notifications turned on to be instantly notified every time we upload. Make sure to be subscribed when patch 9.1 hits because we will be giving you important metagame updates that you won't want to miss. As always, thanks for watching, see you soon.